21-year-old Calvin was an established paraglider. Five years worth of flying time had taught him a thing or two about this complex sport that he'd grown to love. So much so that oftentimes Calvin flew in the rain. Fanatic? Most likely. June 28, 2018, his sixth sensor told him to pack his bags and go home after the paragliding competition was cancelled in Barberton and Pumalanga, five hours outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. Instead, Calvin and his dad chose to play a round of golf and attempt flying the next day. 24 hours later, Calvin flew off a mountain and into power lines that nearly cost him his life. 413 days in the intensive care unit and nine resuscitations later, Calvin is fighting on to regain normalcy. This is how we cope. I'm Hugo Ribatika. Hello everyone and welcome to another intriguing edition of Cope where we get to hear some of the most amazing stories from the bravest of individuals. In the studio today, mother and son, Kelvin and Lee, thank you so much for coming on to Cope. Thank you. Kelvin, let's put this into perspective. A couple of years ago, you flew off a mountain into electric pylons and this is all that you were wearing when you were rescued. Take us through your story. So I'll start off by saying that I've been flying for about five years. I grew up on mountains. My father's been a pilot for about 25 years, so I've grown up on mountains. And uh, you know, it was, I was actually more comfortable in the air than on the ground. Uh, the day before my accident was the first time and only time that I didn't want to fly. We came down the mountain. Do you know why you didn't want to fly? The conditions weren't good. Um, I just wasn't particularly enthusiastic. I, I don't know why. I've, I've gone out flying in the rain before. I've gone out any sort of conditions. I've bunked school. <laughs> I've skipped varsity. I've done things my mother doesn't know about. Mom, you're taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I worked. I earned just enough money to fly. Like, it was my life. Flying was everything. And I didn't want to fly. We came down the mountain, I said to my dad, let's pack up, I'll drive back to Joburg, you don't even have to drive. And he said no, and we flew the next day. We went up the mountain, a friend asked me how I'm feeling, I said I don't want to fly. He, he was as surprised as everyone because, I mean, I'm like paragliding crazy. But anyway, it's a competition, uh, I'm super competitive, I paid to be there and I was going to race. So you know, I strapped up, took off, got up. I was doing well. I was probably third position, which is I consider quite good. And I was racing everyone and you know, trying to get ahead. And to get ahead, you've got to push hard. And I pushed a bit too hard, got low in quite a bad area. There's a lot of trees, not many spots to land. And I decided to land on a dirt road. I don't want to put my glider in a thorn bush. And as I was coming in to land, at the last minute I saw a power line and it was too late. I tried to turn and I think I spun my glider and ended up hitting the power line with my hip. And then, yeah, at that point it was just a massive surge of electricity through my body. It was, I almost felt like I was trying to move, but I couldn't move because it was just like shocking. Mm -hmm. And then I just remember like, almost falling backwards and passing out. I've never passed out before, so I don't know what it feels like, but felt you know, just seeing black going back. And then I woke up on the ground. I don't know how long I'd been lying there for. It could have been 10 seconds, it could have been 10 minutes. And I was just completely engulfed in flames. I could hear the grass crackling. I could smell the smoke. I could, the heat was hitting me. And I was, I was still on fire. Could you feel any pain at the time? I, I couldn't actually, I can't recall any pain. I think it's because most of it was third degree burns and that's, your nerve endings are, are gone. So you can't actually feel anything. But I do know when I was rescued, I was asking for pain. So I was obviously in pain, I just can't remember it. So I woke up, I was on the ground, still fully strapped into my harness. So I had both my leg straps, my chest strap, my cockpit, so I had to undo all of that. And while I was doing this, I was just thinking, if I don't hurry up, uh, I'm gonna die. And I'm still on fire, I'm still burning. 
and it's the weirdest thing because <laughs> I'm looking at myself and I'm thinking this must be painful, but You're it's not, not painful. Pain. And I unclip everything and I try to get up and I, I can't get up. And my left leg is just in agony. That was painful. And then I ended up rolling for about probably 50 meters, just on the, just rolling, trying to get the flames out. And then I stopped once everything was out and I tried to evaluate my situation. Being a paraglider pilot, I was looking at the wind, looking at the fire, seeing which way the fire is spreading. I don't want to get engulfed by the flames again. And uh, I then eventually continued rolling, rolling until I got to a tree. And the tree was at a perfect height where I could do a pull up. Because I was on the ground, so I managed to sort of climb up the tree a bit, grip it, pull up. And then I thought, okay, this is my best chance of just standing here. It's close to the road. I know there's a road there. Then to my right, there was a riverbed. So if the fire was going to come, I could roll into the riverbed as my last option to survive. And then I thought, if anyone comes, I'm going to hear the car. I could shout. And the whole time I'm busy shouting, help, help. You know, I don't know if there's anyone, anyone's going to come. And um, yeah, eventually, the first people on the scene were a couple of paragliding friends. Luckily, another paraglider pilot had seen me and he had dropped a location pin on top of me and he said, Colvin's crashed here. Soon that followed up by the paramedics. And then honestly, when everyone came, I thought it was gonna be fine. <laughs> um, I thought, okay, I've survived. The paramedics are here. No one seemed particularly worried. Or shocked, I presume. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna wake up maybe a couple of days later or maybe even later that evening and my mom's gonna shout at me and say I'm an idiot and, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's gonna be it. I never could have imagined something like this. So mum, accident has happened. How did you find out that Kelvin had been in a crash? So I was walking around pick and pay with my youngest son, Tyron and I got a phone call from my ex-husband Douglas saying Kelvin's had a paragliding accident, he's flown into power lines and isn't moving. And my world just stopped. I don't think your mind can, can take in that degree of trauma. I mean, we're standing in the frozen food section of pick and pay, and I'm going, what do you mean he's, he's flown in? Who flies into power lines? Mm. You know, I mean, it, was, it was the most bizarre thing. And eventually my youngest son took the phone from me and spoke to his father because I was, I was just a wreck, you know. And I just remember saying to Tyron, get your father to phone Kevin. Kevin is my partner. He's got all the medical aid details. Just get Douglas to phone Kevin. And then the call came to an end. And I said to Tyron, well, what do we do? And Tyron says, we need to carry on shopping, Mom. There's no food at home, <laughs> like a teenager does. So we carried on shopping. And we went and paid and got into the car and went home. And he had a beer, I had a glass of wine, and we waited. What was going through your mind at this time? At, at that time, I was just, I, I don't think anything was going through my mind. I was just like, I can't believe this is happening. How does this happen? You know, this, this can't be true. There must be a mistake. You know, it can't be that bad. Um, yeah, you know, I think you just shut down. I think emotionally, mentally, you actually just shut down. You, you can't, you can't, you can't. Now we know that Calvin was then airlifted yeah. from Pumalanga to the Johannesburg Hospital. Yeah, he, he went by ambulance from uh, Barberton to Nelspreit and chopped it in from Nelspreit to, to Mill Park Hospital. So we then went through to the hospital to wait for the chopper to come in. And, and, and that was excruciating, waiting for that chopper to land. And then you hear the blades and, and you know this chopper has your child on board. 
and, and you don't know if your child's dead or alive. You don't know what they're taking off the chopper. And, and, and I collapsed, I absolutely collapsed. You know, Kev was holding me, I was screaming, is that him, is that him? And then they whisk him through and the doctors are waiting, the nurses are waiting. Were you able to see him when he arrived? No, we couldn't see him for hours. You know, and eventually, eventually the, the nurse calls you through and you sit in front of the trauma surgeon and have the conversation. And she says to you, I don't know if your child's going to survive. Uh, the next 72 hours are critical, but he is very, very, very badly injured. What did that do to you as a parent? No, you know what? Your entire world just ends, or binded anyway. You just know with this degree of damage and electricity and flames and inhalation burns that your life is never going to be the same again and his life is never going to be the same again and you just how am i going to deal with this and you do so eventually you get to see kelvin yeah what was that like no look i mean that was absolutely devastating you know, I walked in, he's bandaged from his nipple line down to his ankles. He's in an induced coma. You don't know if he's going to survive. And you just, Kelvin, you can do this. You can do this. You know, we, we're here for you. We'll do it. What else are you going to do? You know. 413 days in intensive care. 413 very long, very traumatic days, yes. Now, Kelvin, it's no secret that you're a fighter. I mean, your attitude today, very, very positive. What's, what's inspired you to fight? Oh, that's a tough question. I, I, I don't actually, I don't know. I think it was a combination of having the support group that I did. I think even though I was out of it most of the time, just having everyone there to help me, be there for me, and looking at other people and w watching them overcome their obstacles, I have nothing to complain about. When I came out of ICU, I can walk, I can talk, I have arms, I have legs. Why do I, I don't have the right to be ungrateful. That face is still pretty. Yeah, oh, I mean, when you go into, an, into a rehabilitation center and you see everyone there and you see someone that's positive and they don't have a leg and they don't have an arm or whatever, and I have, a, I have everything. I mean, I can see, I can taste my food, I can do everything. There's, no, there's nothing to be ungrateful for. In two years' time, I'm going to be fine. Now the support that you've gotten from friends and family, have you gotten the support you, you, you expected or you'd have liked, Lee? No, look, I mean, absolutely. You cannot go through a trauma like this without the support, but it's not just friends and family. You know, it's the doctors and the nurses as well. Absolutely. And I think the, the cleverest thing that we ever did as a family was align ourselves with the doctors and nurses at the hospital and get them on our sides. And they've actually now become personal friends of ours, you know. But I mean, you, you can't go through a trauma like this on your own. The other side of the coin is, you will find there are a lot of spectators in a trauma like this, because people want to be part of the drama. They don't necessarily want to be there to help and assist and support and I want to be part of the drama. Oh, I know the family, I know the kid, I know I did this. I, no, there are a lot of people sitting on the fence, spectators, that are not going to do you any good. So I became very selective as to who I would allow into my inner circle. All that thought, we're speaking to Calvin and his mother, Lee. When we come back, Tanasha joins us for the second half of COPE. This is Cope. Thank you for staying with us. Tanasha, this story about Kelvin, story of strength, survival, 
absolutely incredible. It's amazing. Like, thank you so much, Calvin, for sharing your story. I think a lot of people underestimate the strength you actually need to have to keep reliving the tale and sharing with other people. But it's really, I love how you're asking him earlier, like, how did you fight through? Like, you actually don't know as a person, this is just that the spiritual part of you that just fights through and braves through your experiences. But what we often see with a lot of patients, especially if it's continuous pain, burn victims, like it actually takes, I don't even know, there's another word that's bigger than bravery, but you just power through it. And you almost then realize that part of your purpose becomes sharing with other people that this is something you can experience and then you start coping with it and then you start trying to understand, okay, how do I move on from this while also helping others? I'm sure you found that, you know, over time, it starts being about just a Calvin story. It becomes a, wow, we are such a small group because burn victims, there aren't really a lot of groups of people who survive, especially such a tough trauma. So I think it's quite important that you are sharing the story. That's part of the healing, but kudos to mom because it really, the strength starts from there and it just trickles down to you as a patient and then he becomes the ambassador for how to survive mm. and to push on, really. I'm glad you raised the issue of the pillar of strength. Who have been your pillars of strength, Kelvin? I think everyone in my support system, so from my girlfriend to my mother, my stepdad, my brother, everyone they visited me every day in hospital, Whatever I wanted, if it was coke and I didn't drink it, <laughs> if it was sweets, I wouldn't eat it. I would, I would pretend they weren't even there. I would ignore them, and they still visited me every day. Let's talk about how your life has changed since the crash. Well, I mean, obviously from a physical aspect, I can't do obviously a lot of things that I used to do. I was very sporty. I was can't drive anymore, you know, simple things like that. But I think, like, people often only see the negative. They don't see the positive, the doors and the opportunities that this has opened up for me, the, the, uh, the gratefulness that I have every day. I mean, when you walked in, you mentioned the rain. I didn't experience rain for 413 plus days. Wow. I mean, the first thing they did when I got transferred from ICU to rehab, they put me in the ambulance and they shipped me off. They took me out of the ambulance and I was in the sun. And I said, I'm in the sun already. This is amazing. <laughs> and I asked the guy, can you just leave me just to soak up the, like, I soaked up enough sun in two minutes to last me a lifetime. Yeah, you know? it's beautiful. And, yeah, you don't, I didn't eat food for 400 days. I was getting fed through a tube in my nose. Um, and now I, every time I sit down, no matter what I eat, I'm just like, wow, this is actually really amazing. Is it about, is it about a personality that, that results in that inner strength that, we, that is clearly evident in, in Kelvin? Because I can imagine that there are hundreds of other people in similar situations that have just given up. No, for sure. And it really is your personality, even from before your accident or, and then, so even, remember like tapping into your personality, the people around you's energy, even from the nurses, mm. you know, these are literally the places where you then realize that, oh, I'm still here. Like even him saying, you know, people are giving him things. You're like, ugh, I don't want to <laughs> deal with anyone. All that attitude, those people are literally keeping your senses alive like the fact that you're reacting. So it's about being active because a lot of people around other people will not know how to handle that kind of rejection. Like, oh, he doesn't want us, let's not go to the hospital anymore. Then you start feeling more alone and then you just end up spiraling into really dark depression. And the truth is that once you stop fighting mentally, your body also listens to that. So even without him knowing subconsciously, him by experiencing mm. all of this openly, it actually kept him very alert and very alive and like I said of course he's a he's a competitor I mean of course he was also like daring himself like I wonder if we're gonna make it do this like let's see how how far can I do this you know and that energy carries you through what about your interests Kelvin do you have new interests that have kept you going the last couple of years uh, not really I, I mean I'm still very optimistic that in a couple of months maybe uh, hopefully 
I'll still be able to do you know, the same things that I was doing. I hope to go into motivational speaking, especially motivate other people, show them that it can be done. I mean, no matter what the experts actually say, it uh, can be proven wrong. And uh, yeah, just never stop fighting. And I mean, I hope one day I'll be able to run off a mountain again. And, uh, Would you fly again? No, definitely. Uh, def Don't let mom I've hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, already, I've already been up in a sail plane. Oh, wow. So yeah, that was quite cool. I can't run off a mountain yet, but uh, if I can't run, I'll definitely think about taking up gliding. And that is bravery right there. Like, he's literally talking about going and doing something that is so close and so triggering to the last biggest trauma mm. he's experienced. And like I said, like, we try to put words to it, but that's just him. He's mm. a fighter, he's a survivor, he's a warrior. I mean, how do you put yourself back there? And he's so calm and contained about it, so... That's why I'm like, be definitely, motivational speaking, I'm ready for you to write your book, and, because it really is absolutely stunning. Well, it's definitely in the, in the right place. Mm -hmm. We're behind you 100%, Kelvin. But what I'd like to know is, what is a typical day like in the life of Kelvin? So, if I haven't had any operations done, <laughs> the typical day is waking up, having physio, biokinetics, I have a little bicycle machine, I do that walk around the house a hundred times, <laughs> walk up and down my driveway a hundred times, um, you know, spend a lot of time on my crutches, even if it's just going to the shops with my dad, mm -hmm. just being as active as possible, spending as little time sitting down in my wheelchair. I want to start going to the gym, um, doing stuff like that. I have aquatherapy, which is therapy in a pool. So that's quite cool. You can walk around uh, with the buoyancy of the water and everything. Oh, I've just been super active. Oh. A few weeks ago, I watched one of your videos. And in this video, I think it was the first time that you got up and started walking again. Yeah. What are some of the milestones that you've, you've achieved over the last couple of years? And were these deliberate? Did you think about it? Did you set goals in your mind and say, by this time, I must have achieved this? So I, I definitely did set goals. And I set like crazy goals. Uh, just so that if I didn't achieve them, I would have still achieved a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, rather instead of setting a small goal and achieving it, but still only achieving a little. So I, when I came out, um, I was walking with a walking frame, and I said I'm going to walk an extra two laps around my house each day um, until lockdown ended, and lockdown never ended. Mm -hmm. So I just continued. Mm -hmm. I just continued walking. Presume you didn't uh, walk all at one go. <laughs> yeah, I just added two and two and two, and by after 40 days, it was like 80 laps around my house. Awesome. And then I decided, okay, in three weeks, I'm going to walk with crutches. And after one week, I decided I'm going to try. And I took maybe five steps. But after three weeks, I was independent on my crutches. So that was a massive step. And then, you know, walking with one crutch was also a big one. And for me, the biggest one was just getting up off a chair. So when I look at people getting up off surfaces like a couch or something, I actually physically can't picture it or imagine like how strong you have to be. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a month ago, I managed to do that. So for me, that was just like standing up. I mean, it's not elegant, yeah. but I managed to do it. And for me, that was like, OK, I can, I can do this. Now, mum's been there for you all the time from the very day that you suffered this uh, excruciating uh, injury. Uh, how much of a pillar has she been? No, my mum's been there through everything. Every operation, I, every day in ICU, I mean, my mum went away to Dubai for a week. That's the only seven days she didn't, she didn't visit me. You know, every physio session she's there, every operation afterwards she's been there visiting me, bringing me food, now that I'm eating, dealing with all of the depression that I've gone through, everything. She's just been a rock. So what do you think has been your biggest coping mechanism? For me, I think it's just, I, don't, I feel like I don't have the right to be, to feel sorry for myself. Really going to rehab 
and seeing what happens there and speaking to other people who have gone through things that I've gone through and coming out how well I've come out. Mm. It's, I, don't have, I don't have the right to complain. It's such an absolute bravery, isn't it? <laughs> it's really breathtaking. Like, I want to chime in, but I'm just like, do you want to be a psychologist? Because <laughs> it's already like pulling yourself out of that space for you to be like, actually, I have no right to say I can't or I'm going through too much. There's people who have done the same thing, pushing through it, and you actually are just like, okay, this has to be done. I can do it. There is no time to sit and cry and wonder, okay, why me? Because, I mean, the why me days must have been a few. Yeah. But he's managed to push through that. And that's why I'm glad you mentioned the depression that comes with having chronic pain, chronic illness, having a lifetime of recovery over something that's a big incident. So you did not shy away from getting help. And I think that's always the best place to be because if at all he has said, no, I'm done, it's really a deep dark hole. And I think we all appreciate the fact that he managed to see the light, even though you were not in the sun, <laughs> but yeah. he saw the sun at the end of the tunnel. And that is absolutely important because there were no easy days. I, I, I think I knew that. So just the fact that you can still look forward to being better and then you actually become better and then now that you're here you set another goal you set another goal and it's onwards from here well, speak, speaking of goals what's on the schedule what are your targets well the for me the biggest one is just walking so that's my main focus at the moment is walking just being independent before my accident i was my own person i was yeah. going where i wanted to go doing what i wanted to do and now I think uh, that's the most frustrating thing for me is having to, to be dependent on other people. So you know, I think walking and getting a car, maybe getting, I, I'll only be able to drive an automatic, but even that, um, yeah, just moving forward. Yeah, I'm 23, I need to get on with my life. You need to live your life. I think two more thoughts before we, we wrap up. Firstly, obviously, is what is your message to mums, other relatives that are supporting individuals that might be in similar situations and finally a word of encouragement to someone who might be in the same position as you. Okay so firstly uh, for people that are in a similar situation to me I would say break down what you have. For me I went through a stage where I looked at what I could do and what I could do before my accident and I said there's no ways I'm ever going to get there. So you've got to, instead of saying, I, I can't walk and I need to walk, you go, I can't walk, I need to walk with a walker, I need to walk with my crutches, mm -hmm. with one crutch, a little bit, and baby steps. And sometimes you have to accept even that you're not going to do things that you did before. I mean, I'm, I've accepted that maybe I won't ever climb a mountain again. That's fine. I have a new a new normal, I'm never going to drive a manual again. That's fine, they have automatic cars. Um, so yeah, just that. Well, you know what? You are my hero, and I salute <laughs> you, mate. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on to COPE. Oh, no, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks, right. And I hope you keep sharing. Please write it down. So we can spread it far and wide, and as soon as we can get you into all the countries, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people who desperately need to understand that this is the new normal can also be something you adjust to and you It'll keep it better. going. It really can be better. So I love that breaking down of things like just acceptance of the new normal, and you really can achieve anything once you understand that. So, what an incredible young man! Kudos to Kelvin. This is Cook. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.